Conflicts of interest. So what is a conflict of interest? Well, it's any situation uh, where a trustee's personal interests or the interest that they owe to another body may influence the, their decision making. So the rule is, as we've known, as we said, that trustees should not receive benefit from their charity, you know, unless there is explicit authority from the charity commission uh, gained beforehand. You know, and this relates both to indirect and direct benefits. And again, it's based upon the, the, you know, the principle, the first principle, that trustees should not be in a position where personal interests and their duty to the charity conflict. So where there is a potential for conflict, then that has to be managed. There is always going to be conflicts of interest. It's, it's just a fact of life to a certain extent. It's inevitable. Uh, and so really what this boils down to, this whole section is, is you know, how do we actually manage them when they, when they crop up? So conflict of interest usually arise where either there is a potential financial or a measurable benefit, something beyond the norm that um, benefits a directly a board member or indirectly through a connected person. So, you know, this is a, you know, the, the, the classic example of a conflict of interest. There is another type of conflict of interest, and that is where a board member's duty to the organization may compete with a duty or loyalty they owe to another organization or person, and that's conflict of loyalty. So basically what we're saying there is, I'm just trying to remember what I actually say. Let's keep going actually, and I'll, I'll cover that if I need to. So benefits to board members, what do we mean? Board members can only benefit from their organization where there is an explicit authority in place before any decision conferring a benefit is made. Now, we've said that trustees cannot be employees. They can, they can actually take on a management role, uh, but they can't specifically be an employee of the charity and they can't be paid for taking on that management role. In some instances where there is professional services that could be given to a charity, then there is an assumption that the trustee is the best person to actually give those professional services and this can be sanctioned and generally speaking it needs to be sanctioned either by uh you know it needs to be stated in the governing document and i've seen some governing documents particularly around things like uh, accountancy you know where where an uh, um an accountant is a governor is a, is a trustee or, or perhaps even the treasurer you know there is the ability because they're providing a professional services they they can actually be remunerated for, for the professional service aspect of their role. Um, there was another query that came into us, um, uh, much more mundane, uh, and that was a professional service, but it was a professional service from a plumber. Basically, there was a water leak in, in, a, in a charity, in a charity's premises. Uh, one of the trustees fixed it. Uh, and in fixing it, they spent about four or five hours of their time plugging the leak, you know, uh, and doing that type of stuff. And, and there was this question that came into Pavo, we were, well, mm, mm, can we pay him for it? You know, it was, it, it saved us money. It was, it was, it was an emergency. You know, if we'd have had to wait for X amount of time for, for, you know, to call out the emergency plumber, then we'd have been in stock, etc. So, you know, where do you draw the line? Now, generally speaking, as I say, governing document is a good place to start. You're not going to be in the situation I've just um, discussed in terms of the plumber. You're not going to be uh, going to the charity commission um, before you can employ your trustee plumber, because to be quite frank, you might have to wait 12 weeks. And that's quite a lot of water out of your pipes, shall we say. So a pragmatic approach to some of this. But the basic principle is that, you know, you're not going to be employing a trustee to deliver services to the charity without understanding um what the market is around you as well how do you actually go about making the decision to employ your trustee rather than a n other accountant you know what sort of process do you put in place to make sure that you're not conferring a benefit that you know there are others that you could potentially contract to perform a service rather than your trustee etc um so we'll come on to that again a little bit more Examples of potential benefits uh, is where boards decide to so sell, loan, lease an organization's assets to a board member. You know, you're in a you're in a privileged position. You've got yeah, insider information in terms of um, you know what uh, what assets are available, etc. 
uh, acquire, borrow, or lease assets from a board member for the organization. So you're paying rent to a, um, you know, uh, one of your board members, etc. It is doable, but you know, there's a decision-making process and a process that has to be managed. Pay a board member for carrying out their board member role. You certainly can't do that. Pay a board member for carrying out separate paid posts within the organization, even if that board member has recently resigned as a board member. So, you know, there again, it's, these are the sort of the areas where you have to be careful because, you know, you'd be looking like you'd be providing a benefit to somebody who has been either on the trustee board or is still remaining on the trustee board. Um, I'll leave you go through. I won't read that out slavishly. So you, you're getting the idea. There's there's things on there in terms of employer, board members, spouse or other close relative at the organisation. These are all potential areas where you'll be conferring a benefit. And again, you know, it doesn't necessarily rule it out, but you just have to manage how you actually approach these situations. We mentioned earlier, you know, the final one there, allow a service user board member to influence service provision to their exclusive advantage. It's where it's exclusive that, that there is a, an issue. It's where you're receiving a benefit that others who are helped by the charity don't receive. Uh, looking at conflicts of loyalty. So these are arising because, you know, although the affected board member does not necessarily stand to gain anything directly, there are consequences to the board member's decision making that could influence their choice in terms of what they do. Uh, so, for example, the board member's loyalty to the organisation could conflict with their loyalty to, you know, perhaps they might be a trustee on, on another organisation. You might be competing for the delivery of services. Um, uh, it's unlikely that you'd be a trustee of two similar charities, but, you know, it could help, could happen. Um, the membership or section of organization that appointed them to a board member. So, yeah, this is a I mentioned right at the start about committees of management whereby um, representatives, people are asked to organizations rather are asked organizations in an area of benefit. Again, this, this was, if you remember, was the, the community center example. So you have a community center and, and to make sure that it's uh, the views on that, the management committee of the community center are representative. Um, all the organizations that might use the center get to nominate a trustee to the management committee of the community center. That command management committee is a board. It's a, they are all trustees. Uh, and But there is a mental block a lot of the time with both with the organization that sends the person to the community center charity and um, with the person who comes themselves, that they actually are representative. They are there to do the bidding of the organization that sent them. And that's not the case. They are there to basically represent the interests of the charity and the management of the community center. But what they can do is they can bring a perspective that is wider right it's from the area of benefit so but they are not there to represent the interest so if it's a community center and, and let's think there's a there's an indoor bowls club uh they are not there to do the bidding of the indoor bowls club on the management committee of the charity so that's a conflict of loyalty um so yeah uh we're all have other lives we all have sort of you know day jobs etc if we're a trustee of an organization um and probably i'm might be a, a good example of this actually yeah so I, I'm a, a, a director certainly of a, a community interest company uh, but I'm also an employee of Pavo so then you know there's the potential for a conflict in terms of actually having to go and, and, and pass on messages to that organization etc can I represent the two at the same time um, or another round oh, yes so you might be a board member of two different organizations obviously there's the family connection you know don't know how well you get on with your family it could be an interesting dynamic but you know you need to be careful about how decisions that you make can affect family members etc okay so i think hopefully conflicts of interest on conflicts of loyalty is is, is self-explanatory so where are we going with this so the test what does it look like is that you know there is a there is a conflict of interest test so and to a certain extent it is whether you know, the test is that there is a conflict of interest if the board members, so the other board members, not just you, the other board members uh, interest could or could be seen to interfere with the board members ability to decide the issue only in the best interest of the organization. So are you are you making that decision 
And are you being seen to make that decision based upon its merits or are you being influenced by an outside influence, whether that be an influence that gives you a personal benefit or whether that gives you, you know, a conflict of loyalty elsewhere. And there's a legal requirement in this, and that is that directors um, or trustees of organisations and companies must have authority in their governing document to allow unconflicted directors to decide that board members affected by the conflict can participate. So, you know, what happens if you've got a situation where you've got a conflict of interest? How do you actually decide whether that the scale, the nature of that conflict of, in, conflict of interest. Do you allow the person who's conflicted to sit in on the decision making, possibly even have a vote? Do they leave the room? You know, and to a certain extent, you you have uh, the ability to to uh, uh, to come up with your own policy on this. It's always wise for organisations to have conflicts of interest policy that state that where a conflict arises well actually how to identify a conflict in the first instance and and there are things like um, a register of potential interests so each director each trustee lists the organizations that they are involved with um, and that list basically is available at each meeting so that you know or other board members know where you potentially would have a conflict of interest Obviously, then if an item comes up on the agenda where there is a potential conflict of interest, that director stroke trustee should be in a position to uh, declare their interest. The board then has a policy which then decides, well, OK, so is that director able to contribute to the discussion around what the decision should be? It might be that that director is actually very well informed about a particular subject because they are conflicted and that you know they can actually provide advice or they can provide at least participate in the discussion of the board but then have to leave when the decision is taken or you could just make it simple if you are conflicted in any way shape or form out you go well make a decision without any potential for a perception that you know that we're paying too much attention to the reasons why you're conflicted etc so basically the bottom line even uh, where you have that policy in place, even where you've got a clear process, you know, you should ensure that you can demonstrate that any decision that's been taken is being taken in the best interest of the organisation. That is the bottom line. All of what we've been discussing in terms of roles and responsibilities is that you're not acting in your own interest. You are acting collectively in the best interest of the organisation.